Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to my Kamigawa Neon Dynasty Draft Guide. In this video, I'm going to be giving you all of the information you need to succeed in Neon Dynasty Draft. But before I dive in, I want to remind you that if you enjoy this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel for more draft content, and comment below with your questions, thoughts, and feedback. Let's dive in. In this guide, I will be discussing the set mechanics, the top three commons for each color. I will give archetype overviews. I will be going through the combat tricks you need to be aware of. And then I will discuss trap cards to avoid, combos you can assemble, and more. So let's get started with the set mechanics. In the set, there is reconfigure, modified, sagas, ninjutsu, channel, and vehicles. So reconfigure is a new mechanic. It is for creatures and it lets them become equipments. So you pay the reconfigure cost and you attach your creature to another creature as an equipment. If that creature dies, you get the reconfigure card back or you can pay the reconfigure card cost again and get the creature back into creature form so you can equip it to something else or just use it as a creature. So with Arm Guard Familiar, it's a two mana two one, but you can pay four to equip a creature and give it plus two plus one and ward two, just like the Arm Guard Familiar itself has ward two. Next up is Modified. It is a mechanic that cares about creatures that have counters on them, or is attached to them, or equipments equipped to them, and it will essentially give you a reward for having those creatures uh, modified, or it will count the number of modified creatures or things of that nature. So Aki Ember Keeper is an example, and whenever a non-token modified creature you control dies, you'll get a 1-1 colorless spirit creature token. So it's a nice little reward for having modified creatures. Next up is Sagas. It is a returning mechanic, and it has an interesting twist this time around. Basically, a Saga comes into play with a lore counter on it, and you'll do the Chapter 1 ability. After your draw step, you add a lore counter and do the next chapter ability. In the case of some Sagas, that ability is the same, so that is the case with Tales of Master Sashiro. You'll put a plus one plus one counter on target creature or vehicle and give it vigilance until end of turn. And then after your next draw step, you'll add another lore counter and then do the third chapter ability. And in the case of Sagas in this set, the cool twist is that they all will exile themselves and then come back as creatures. So Sashiro, <laughs> Tales of Master Sashiro will exile itself and come back as Sashiro's living legacy when it gets to chapter three. Next up is Ninjutsu, another returning mechanic. This one rewards you for having unblocked attacking creatures. It is an activated ability that you use for creatures in your hand, and you pay the Ninjutsu cost, return an unblocked attacker to your hand, and then you have the Ninjutsu card enter the battlefield tapped and attacking. So Dakuchi Shadow, Shadow Walker is a 6 mana 5-5, five five, but if you pay the Ninjutsu cost, you can get it down into play for just 4 mana. Next is Channel. It is an ability that lets you discard a card from your hand, pay its channel cost, and get the channel ability instead of casting the card normally. So if, with the case of Sunblade Samurai, it's either a 5 mana 4 for Vigilance, or you can pay the channel cost of 2, discard it, and search your library per planes, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle and you gain 2 life. So you kind of have some split functionality there. Finally, there are vehicles, another returning mechanic. The way vehicles work is they let you tap creatures to crew them. So they are kind of like creatures, but they're not always activated. And in order to activate them, you have to tap creatures with power equal to the crew cost of the vehicle. So for Brute Suit, you just have to tap any number of creatures you control with total power one or more. You can overkill tap, in which case you can like just tap whichever number of creatures you can don't have to crew with the exact number. And if you, for some reason, wanted to crew Brute Suit with multiple creatures, even though you only needed to crew it with one of them, you're also allowed to do that. And so the, the vehicle will become a creature until the end of the turn, and then after that it will be back to being just an artifact until you crew it once more. Moving on to the top commons, starting with white. At number one is Intercessor's Arrest. This is just a rock-solid removal spell that white is going to need, whether it is aggressive or defensive, and the fact that it can stop the creatures it enchants from crewing vehicles is a nice little perk in a set where that could be an actually pretty big downside. So Intercessor's Arrest gets the nod at number one. At number two is Igonjo Exemplar. It's a two-drop that can attack with three power on turn three, which is quite powerful, and it even has added utility in the late game by buffing up your other samurais or even itself, 
once you are no longer able to profitably attack with it, and it's an enchantment creature for decks that care about that. And then coming in at number three is Spirited Companion. It is a very strong effect to have a cantripping creature, but it is only a 1-1 and it is quite small, and one of the reasons why Igonjo Exemplar gets the nod over it is because white tends to be a very aggressive color, and so you would rather have a high power attacker early in the game than just this cute little dog that replaces itself, though Spirited Companion is still quite strong. Moving on to blue, at number one is The Modern Age, so this is a saga where its first two chapters are draw a card, then discard a card, and then its third chapter, you exile it, and then it comes back into play as a 2-3 flyer. The reason this card is good is because looting is very powerful in limited. It helps you hit your land drops or get rid of excess lands in the late game, and also a 2-3 flyer is quite a powerful reward to get for only two mana, especially because you're getting some nice card filtering in between getting that flyer. Next up is Moon Circuit Hacker. It is a ninja card with ninjutsu, and it has a ninjutsu cost of one and a normal cost of one and a blue. Whenever it deals combat damage, you can draw a card, and if you do, you discard a card, which is really nice. Once again, looting is quite powerful, but if it entered the battlefield this turn, you get to just straight up draw a card. So it basically, if you use the ninjutsu ability or you somehow give it haste to attack them immediately, you don't have to discard a card. So nice card advantage built into a two drop. Two drops are super key and limited, and Moon Circuit Hacker is a great card as a result. And then finally is Moon Snare Specialist. Four mana for a 2-2 two -two that bounces a creature is already a pretty solid card, but the fact that you can ninjutsu this in for just two and a blue means that sometimes you're getting a truly powerful tempo play indeed, and that makes Moon Snare Specialist a great card to have in your deck, especially if you have the ability to enable that ninjutsu ability. Moving on to black, we start off with a premium removal spell in Twisted Embrace. Not only is it 4 mana to kill any creature, but it also enchants one of your, your creatures, gives it plus 1 plus 1, and also helps you trigger modified cards. So that's a real nice upside to have for this set in particular. At number 2 is Okiba Reckoner Raid. It's 1 mana, and then it will drain the opponent for 2 life over the course of 2 turns, and then you will get a 2-2 two -two Menace creature that gives vehicles you control Menace as well. So for 1 mana, you're getting quite a big life swing, and it's just a very efficient creature overall. At number 3 is Lethal Exploit, a card that starts off as 2 mana for minus 2 minus 2, which isn't inherently that powerful, but it's not that hard to have at least one card with modified, and once you start giving minus 3 minus 3, or even minus 4 minus 4 or more for just 2 mana at instant speed, it truly becomes a powerful removal spell. Moving on to red, speaking of powerful removal spells, at number 1 is Kami's Flare. 2 mana, deal 3 damage, instant speed, and you can even deal 2 damage to your opponent if you have a modified creature. Truly a powerful removal spell and a top common for red. At number 2 is Voltage Surge. 1 mana to deal 2 damage at instant speed is normally a pretty solid effect anyway, and the fact that you can sacrifice an artifact to deal 4 damage and take out something bigger is really nice to have on this card, giving it some nice flexibility and the ability to really trade up on mana. So that makes it the number 2 red common. And at number 3 is Tawashi, Tawashi Song Shaper. Red that tends to be an aggressive color, so you're going to need those aggressive two drops, and Tawashi Song's Shaper is another card that can attack with three power as early as turn three, which is really nice to have in your red decks. It helps it push through, force trades, or just push damage to your opponent, and it's an artifact for any artifact synergies. Moving on to green, at number one is Master's Rebuke, an instant speed punch spell, if you will, for green, bite spells as they are oftentimes known, where your creature simply deals damage equal to its power to a creature or planeswalker you don't control. Green does have some nice big creatures in this set, so you're often going to be able to use this to kill anything your opponents might have, and the fact that it is at instant speed means you are less likely to get blown out in the process. At number two is Fade into Antiquity, another great removal spell for green because there are tons of artifacts and enchantments in this set, especially artifact creatures and enchantment creatures. So you're going to be able to have a real impact on the board for just three mana, exiling a lot of the key threats. Speaking of large enchantment creatures, Greater Tanuki comes in at number three for green, six mana for a 6-5 trample is a little bit understated, we would normally see a 6-6 six, six or something of that nature, but the fact that you're able to use the channel ability, discard the Tanuki, and get a land, basic land card into play tapped uh, when you don't have the 6 mana, you, the fact that you're able to still use the Tanuki in the early turns and even fix your mana is quite powerful and makes Greater Tanuki a fantastic addition to your green decks. Moving on to some color rankings, of course it is worth noting with any color ranking, that drafting the open color for your seat is going to give you a more powerful deck than simply forcing the colors that are the best, but if you are making a tiebreaker pick or choosing between a close 
cards of different colors. This is the order I would recommend for your color rankings. Red at number one, it just has such premium removal spells and even has nice artifact synergies as you go down deeper into the common pool. Green at number two, the fact that it gets two great removal spells in this set really pushes it up a notch because oftentimes green is held back by its lack of removal, but now it really gets to shine not only with its strong creatures, but also with its strong removal. At number three is black. Again, great removal spells and just good creatures and cards overall. Blue, a little bit worse, but still overall a solid color. It just suffers from a lack of good removal spells in this set, so you're going to have to pair it with a color that can give it access to some ways to remove threats. And then white coming in at last place. It is by no means a bad color. I wouldn't say avoid white, but if you are making a close pick, maybe you edge away from white. It is mostly going to be an aggressive color. Sometimes that doesn't work as well, and... Uh, it maybe leaves you less flexible with your draft picks or your strategies, but it is still a solid color. All of the colors are playable and you shouldn't be shying away from any of them or overly forcing your draft in any one direction. Moving on to the archetype overviews, starting off with red-white. This is a color combination that is aggressive fundamentally and also has some triggers where your cards care about you attacking with just one creature, usually a samurai or a warrior. So with a card like Asari Captain, you're able to get extra power onto your creatures as long as they are attacking alone, which is a great way to push through a board stall once your opponent assembles some large blockers. A card like Tempered in Solitude can get you extra card advantage, and a card like Selfless Samurai can make sure you're winning the race with lifelink. Moving on to blue-black, this is the ninjutsu color pair. It's got a card like Silver Fur Master, which buffs all of your ninjas and rogues. It also makes your ninjutsus cost a little bit less. And then you have some nice payoffs like Prosperous Thief, which are going to help you pull ahead on mana while you're hitting with your ninjas, redeploying the cards that you're bouncing to your hand to deploy your ninjutsu cards. And then it also gains access to a great card, Dakuchi Silencer, which lets you just trade a card from your hand for a card your opponent put into play, which is really nice tempo-wise. So it's really going to help you pull ahead of your opponents. Moving on to green-white, this is a color combination that cares about enchantments. You can use a card like Jukai Naturalist to really push ahead on mana, cast your cards ahead of schedule. A card like Generous Visitor to really buff up your creatures and get sizable creatures early on in the game before your opponent has a chance to deal with them simply by casting enchantments. And similarly, Sky Blessed Samurai is going to cost a lot less if you are building around that enchantment theme. Moving on to blue-red, this is a color combination that cares about artifacts. Enthusiastic Mechanaut can make your artifacts cost less. Replication Specialist can copy your artifacts. And a card like Dragon Spark Reactor not only turns into a powerful removal if you're playing a ton of artifacts, but also can be used to deal a bunch of damage to your opponent's face if you are in a aggressive variant of this sort of deck. So basically, you're going to want to put a lot of artifacts into your deck and then embrace these synergies. Moving on to green-black, it's got a little bit of value built in, it's got a little bit of modified synergy built in, and it also has just some great rock-solid removal spells because green does have good removal in this set. Gloom Shrieker is just a great two-for-one card. Unforgiving One can be really nice for returning creatures into play if you are able to spread some counters around, and a card like Roaring Earth with the ability to put counters on your creatures whenever you play a land is really nice for putting counters all around so that you can get those modified cards rolling. Moving on to blue-white, this is a color combination that cares about vehicles in this set. It can use a card like Prodigy's Prototype to not only attack with a relatively sizable vehicle, but also to start making pilots so you can crew your other vehicles. It can use a card like Hotshot Mechanic as an excellent pilot as well, and Mobilizer Mech can crew your vehicles as well, so you may be able to get a couple of big vehicles into play, and then with only a single creature, you can maybe get uh, multiple pilots into play or just crew multiple vehicles in one turn and swing with a bunch of large creatures before your opponent has defenses ready that can deal with creatures of that size. Moving on to red-green, this is another deck that can care about modified stuff. It can lean more aggressively slanted if it's embracing the red aspect of the deck, using a card like Uprise or Renegade to... Uh, really buff up its stats by putting counters on a lot of your creatures, or can lean towards a more big creatures direction using a card like Orochi Merge Keeper to ramp into your larger threats. A card like Invigorating Hot Spring lets you spread those counters around, gives your creatures haste, so you continually uh, can apply pressure regardless of whether you're going a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller with your creature suite. Moving on to white-black, this is a color combination that cares about having artifacts and enchantments in play. Naomi, Naomi Pillar of Order is a card that can just take over the game if your opponent doesn't answer it and if you're able to get an artifact and enchantment into play. Michiko's Reign of Truth is a card that can give some serious buffs out before flipping into Portrait of Michiko and being a relatively sizable creature if you can get those artifacts and enchantments into play. And then Nizumi Blade Blesser can go from the humble 3-2 that it is into a 3-2 Death Touch Menace if you're able to enable it which is clearly much more powerful. So 
if you're able to get this sort of synergy going, your black-white deck can really start powering up. Next is blue-green. This is just a classic big mana ramp deck. It uses cards with the channel ability incredibly well because it can then cram them into the deck and still have early plays. So a card like Colossal Sky Turtle is a great example of this. It's a 7-mana 6-5 flyer with Ward 2. So when you cast it, it's incredibly powerful, but sometimes you won't be able to get to that late stage of the game. So it has two channel abilities that let you kind of bridge that gap until you get to your late game. Blue-green also has access to other great late-game cards like Behold the Unspeakable, which is going to be a 5-mana way to kind of blank your opponent's attacks for a turn, then refuel your hand, and then finally flip into a sizable threat. And then it can also use a lot of green's early creatures like Fang of Shigeki, a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one death touch creature, to hold the fort down while you get towards your powerful late-game. So don't sleep on those early-game plays that you're going to need to survive in the early turns. The final archetype to discuss is Black Red, which is a grindy value artifact sacrifice deck. It uses a card like Oni Cult Anvil to sacrifice your artifacts while slowly draining your opponent out and making a stream of 1 1s. Undercity Scrounger can be used to turn your dying creatures into more artifacts to fuel your synergy fires. And then Sakenzin's Melter can also turn your artifacts into bigger and more creature relevant artifacts as 3 1s, which allows you to slowly start taking over the board while fueling your other artifact synergies and sacrifice stuff. So it's a nice little synergistic deck that can use all of these small little pieces together to form a cohesive game plan that just dominates the game. Moving on to the combat tricks section, we see quite a few here. White has three combat tricks to be aware of. Light the Way, which gives a plus one, plus one counter and untaps a creature. Regent's Authority, which gives plus two, plus two, and can offer an extra benefit to enchantment creatures. When We Were Young, which can be really devastating if it does work, because it is expensive to set up, but can potentially win two combats at once, so definitely is one you need to be aware of. Suit Up, which can also turn an unmanned vehicle into a dangerous blocker or attacker, so keep that one in mind as well. In Blue... Black gets a couple of combat tricks, return to action, which only gives a single point of power, but prevents the creature from dying, and you are already dead, which essentially gives a creature death touch for a turn, but is really hard to interact with. I'm kind of counting it as a combat trick because it's certainly something you'll need to be aware of in combat. Red gets a few combat tricks as well. Ambitious Assault as a mass pump spell that can even replace itself if you have some modified going on. Iron Hoof Boar, which doubles as a massive haste attacker, and also a combat trick that can't be countered because it's a channel combat trick, which is quite nice. Kindled Fury is a tiny combat trick that hasn't historically been quite relevant, but it's always a card you need to be aware of at the very least. And then green gets a few combat tricks as well. Boon of Beseju can really buff up your creatures and untap them, so be aware of that. Favor of Jukai can be an aura if you want it, or it can just be a combat trick that gives reach. Story Weave can be used to flip sagas, but it can also just be used uh, to put two plus one plus one counters on a creature, which if that creature then th survives the combat becomes a very scary threat. And then finally, green also gets Tamiyo's safe Safekeeping, which is kind of like a combat trick, but also kind of like a way to dodge removal spells, and it can win like combats between creatures that would have normally traded. So that's a card to be aware of as well. Moving on to some of the trap cards, starting off with Discover the Impossible. This card is just very inefficient for what it does. It essentially replaces itself, but just because it's an uncommon, don't be fooled. It's not a playable card. Bronze Cudgels, also an uncommon, so it can sometimes be like, oh, this card's really cool, but... It is super inefficient to actually gain any stats out of this. You don't want to be paying six mana to start buffing your creature up to a scary level, or really even four mana to buff it up like plus three plus oh, and uh, you just are better off leaving bronze cudgels in that decorative showcase that you see them in in the artwork. Reckoner Shakedown, another take on a three mana discard spell. These cards are just never really good because they just don't affect the board enough, and oftentimes your opponent might just not have anything good in their hand anyway. And then Aki Warpaint, a card that looks cheap and like a cool way that could potentially trigger modified, but all it's going to do is open you up to getting two for one and just really ruin your own game plans. Next up are some combos you can assemble in this set, starting off with the one that is often kind of referred to as a reanimator combo, where you can use a card like Mirror Shell Crab, use its channel ability to discard it, and then use Okiba Salvage for 5 mana to get it back into play, and that's going to get you a 7 drop at way ahead of schedule. It's also nice because Mirror Shell Crab is an artifact, so you're already halfway there towards triggering the second line of text on Okiba Salvage, which will put two extra plus one plus one counters onto that crab, and also you can kind of just swap out the Mirror Shell Crab with any big channel creature. Next up is the combination that is classic, where you steal your opponent's creature and then sacrifice it. The Shattered States era is a 5-mana way with its first chapter to steal a creature. 
until end of turn, and then you can pair that with a card like Dockside Chef, which you have to pay two mana to sacrifice an artifact or creature. It is also worth noting that the uh, Shattered States era will flip into a 3-3 in its final chapter, just in case you didn't know what the card did. And it's also worth noting that because there are a lot of artifact creatures in the set, you can pair the Shattered States era with a card that sacrifices artifacts, like Scrapyard Steelbreaker, to sacrifice your opponent's artifact creature. So you don't that way you can potentially get a little bit of a cheaper sacrifice outlet because when you're already paying five mana to steal your opponent's creature, you want your sacrifice outlet to be as cheap as possible. The next combo is between Kami of Industry and Reinforced Ronin. The way it works is you can bring the Ronin back into play with the Kami of Industry's ability, and then on your end step, instead of having to sacrifice the Ronin, you can order the triggers such that you return the Ronin to your hand before the sacrifice trigger would resolve, so you essentially get yourself a free Ronin if you have that combo in your deck, and you can cast that Kami of Industry when the Ronin is already in your graveyard. And then the final combo is between Anchor to Reality and Thundersteel Colossus, essentially a four mana way to get a 7-7 seven, seven Trample Haste creature into play attacking your opponent, which is really quite powerful. It may look like you can only do this on turn four because Anchor to Reality costs four, but because of the existence of Moon Snare Prototype, a one mana ramp card in blue, you can sometimes even enable that combo on turn three, which is truly devastating indeed. Next up is the mana fixing in this set, and there is a lot of it. Starting off with the lands, we see Uncharted Haven as a way to get mana fixing in any color combination. You simply play your Uncharted Haven, name whichever color you want, and all of a sudden you can just tap for that color, which is really nice to have access to. It's great if you're trying to enable a two-color deck or even just trying to splash around, uh, which is really nice. Dismal Backwater is on this slide as a representation for all 10 of the gain lands coming back. So each two-color combination gets an enters the battlefield tap land that will gain you a life. So that's a great way to splash as well. And then there's also Secluded Courtyard if you're trying to splash a creature that is a very specific creature type. For example, maybe you want to splash a red samurai in a black-white deck that has samurais in it or something of that nature. Moving on to some artifacts, there is Ecologist's Terrarium as a way to get a basic land from your deck, and then later on fuel your modified synergies. You can also use Network Terminal as a way to ramp your mana and also fix your mana and then potentially loot away excess lands in the late game. And then if you're moving on to green mana fixing, we have access to Grafted Growth, which is a way to fix, fix your mana and put a counter on a creature, and also to the Greater Tanuki, Tanuki that we already looked at earlier. Moving on to some final tips about the format, over 25% of the cards are artifacts and over 25% are enchantments, which is really important to know because it makes a card like Banishing, Banishing Slash really quite powerful, destroying an artifact or an enchantment for only two mana is really nice, also can destroy creatures, but it's worth noting that there are such a high number of artifacts and enchantments that even a card like Explosive Entry, which only destroys an artifact, can potentially be main deckable if the circumstances line themselves up where you need extra interaction or things of that nature in your deck. Another thing that's worth noting is that it's very important to be careful with your blocks because ninjas and combat tricks make things very tough. If you leave a key creature unblocked, your opponent might sneak in a devastating ninja. However, if you do block it, you need to be aware that sometimes they're going to have a combat trick that's really going to blow out that block. So you need to make sure that with your key creatures, maybe you don't block them, block with them, but that you're willing to like kind of trade with your creatures or be willing to get wrecked by some combat tricks uh, to avoid the ninjas, or you at least need to be aware of all the possibilities, because if you just block willy-nilly, your opponent's going to have some combat tricks or some ninjas that are really going to make things difficult for you. And because ninjas punish you for not blocking, it's just a really delicate balancing act. So just be aware of all of the combat tricks. Maybe go back to that slide again to see the ones that you need to be careful of, and maybe look through the list of cards so you know which ninjas to be aware of as well. Anyway, that is going to do it for this video. I really do hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching. If you did make it all the way to the end, remember to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and comment if you have questions or feedback. And to let me know you made it all the way to the end, leave hashtag Conquer Kamigawa to let me know you're all ready to go out into that world of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty and crush your drafts. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you next time.